Welcome to University Television Presents. I'm your host, Jamie Bingham. My guests today are two Boise State Herpetology Workshop instructors. Frank Lundberg is a founder of the Idaho Herpetological Society and has been honored with the organization's award for outstanding contributions to herpetology in Idaho. Scott Smith is a co-presenter of the educational program Rattlesnake Awareness and Outdoor Safety in Idaho. Both gentlemen are part of ecosneak.com, a reptile conservation resource that provides understanding of the role of reptiles and amphibians in wild in captivity. This website also provides informational and educational programs on the natural history and captive care of these animals. I would now like to welcome Frank Lundberg and Scott Smith. Hello, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Um, now before we get to these animals that you brought, I just want to start with a little bit about your background and how you got interested in taking on a career with amphibians and reptiles. Well, Jamie, I was always interested in wildlife, I think since I was a kid. Any type of animal, anything that was going on outdoors, I was interested in. And as I continued to study these creatures and actually study anything else, I became more and more fascinated with what snakes are doing. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Snakes are, are terribly misunderstood mm -hmm. uh, and also snakes are different from us. So what is it that something that's so different from us can teach us that can help us learn how to live better lives and also to take better care of the earth? So that was really the beginning and it's just led to everything that hopefully we're, we're accomplishing now for wildlife and for conservation. Awesome. Um, I got out of the Navy in 1996 and was looking for a job and, and wound up uh, being a, a veterinary technician. And I was very fortunate to work for Dr. Debbie Wiggins, who was kind of the area's wildlife specialist. And uh, kind of under her tutelage, I learned all kinds of stuff. Uh, we, we did everything from, you know, dental cleanings and extractions on grizzly bears to uh, intubating and performing surgery on rattlesnakes. and just. Over the years, I really uh, gained a, a big appreciation for amphibians and reptiles. And how did all that lead you here to Boise State to teach a workshop about reptiles? Well, about, uh, it's hard to believe now, but 20 years ago, uh, some folks who worked in both the, the biology department and extended studies, I guess it was called continuing ed then, uh, knew about some of the things that I'd been doing with snakes and with amphibians and reptiles. And one day a, a, a friend who worked there said, would you like to do a workshop? And I guess that's how it started. And at the same time, we were looking for guest speakers and people to come in to supplement. So we had the animals and we had me, but we didn't have any other expertise. And Scott and Dr. Wiggins at the time came and they've been, or he has helped now for the last 18 years. So basically it was, uh, uh, I suppose, a word of mouth, but uh, thanks to the university and some people who were interested, and it's to the university's credit, that they were interested in these animals and we can provide information to students for all these years. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we're talking about this workshop, but I want to get to the snake that you have okay. for us. And um, you mentioned to me that this is one of the most common in Idaho, is that correct? Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about this animal that well, you brought? What we did, we brought a... a Feel free a, to take them out, we too. We brought about four different snakes today, and two of them are Idaho natives. In Idaho, we have 12, only have 12 species of snakes because of our high elevation and our cold temperatures. But this guy is one, this is called a Great Basin gopher snake. Sometimes people call them bull snakes, but the correct name is gopher snake. And this is a guy that you'll see in the foothills <laughs> around Boise. Yeah. You'll see in the deserts around Boise. And uh, so since he's very, very common, we thought people would like to have a chance to meet him today. And you mentioned that some people call it a bull snake. Like, how did that even start? Why do you think people? Well, actually, um, the gopher snake is a cousin of the bull snake. Mm -hmm. They're part of a, a, the, what we call a pine bull gopher snake complex. They all f have the same genus, Pituophis. And what Pituophis means is a uh, hissing or spitting snake. Mm -hmm. So uh, these guys here have an enlarged glottic opening. So when they hiss, they can hiss really, really loud. Um, so. In the west part of the, uh, of the country, you have the gopher snakes, and that's what we have here. Once you get into the Midwest, then a cousin of these guys you'll find, and that's the bull snake. So yeah. I think just people, they look very similar, uh, and, and probably as people moved into the west, they thought they were the same species, so they just continue to call them 
uh, bull snakes, but technically we have gopher snakes here. Now, are these very dangerous? No, uh, these guys are actually, uh, if anything, very beneficial. Um, as far as our local native snakes, they are, uh, they're probably the most ravenous ones we have. They'll eat a lot of the rodent population. Uh, they'll keep the rodent population down, therefore we're not spreading disease or the rodents aren't eating our crops. Uh, so they're probably very beneficial. Um, and you know, you can run into these guys in the wild and they will put up a big fuss. They'll hiss a lot. They'll kind of rear back and maybe even make striking motions at you. But if you were to be uh, bitten by one of these snakes, um, you know, it'd feel like a little pinch. There's no, no venom, nothing to worry about. So. The fact that they hiss and that they're fairly large also is uh, one of the reasons they're called bull snakes. Mm -hmm. It's the early pioneers who came across the United States in the covered wagons or whatever uh, would see them and they would make so much noise and they were big and they'd say, oh, they bellow like a bull. So that's how they got their, their name. So, but it's all bluff. He just wants you to go away and you'll learn with all the snakes, they're just simply very, very shy and they simply want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. So in your workshop, is this one of the common ones that you bring? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we try to introduce uh, quite, a, quite a few of Idaho's native snakes so people know what they're, they're going to encounter when they're out there mm -hmm. on a hike or something like that. And where would you say is the most common to find these? Like if we're hiking around just up here by the foothills, would we see some of these? Yeah, anywhere around uh, southwest, southern Idaho actually from, from uh, well even up in the northern part of the state it would be a different subspecies the Pacific gopher snake but mm -hmm. but it's it's really really common and they're again very beneficial because of the rodents that they uh, they consume. Awesome so talking a little bit more about your workshop um, who would you recommend takes this workshop and how many credits is offered for it? Well it's like all the workshops on the campus it's simply a one credit uh, two-day pass-fail workshop, and we've geared it over the years towards all students. Uh, the biology students enjoy it because it, it offers them a chance to get some additional information that they don't get any other place about snakes and lizards and mm -hmm. turtles and tortoises and crocodilians, but for any student on the campus. And what's one of the cool things is for all of the students over the years, we, we we have every field of study on the campus. So it's, I think since like, for example, him, he's something everybody sees. Mm -hmm. It's really a great opportunity then for everyone, whether they're a biology student or a computer science student or communications major to know, well, this is a gopher snake and he's out there and he's gonna help us and he's beneficial and he's not gonna hurt us. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if you want to bring out another one now, you well, mentioned there was another common one. We brought Idaho. another uh, common snake from Idaho. I'm I guess close you want to bag, yeah, yeah, let's close him up. Now that he, he'll escape. He'll escape. Let's set him over here for a second. And uh, a lot of people in Idaho don't realize that uh, we have in Idaho a native boa constrictor. And this is Idaho's native boa constrictor. And this guy is found all over the state. Uh, he's called a rubber boa is his name. His scientific name is Karina Batai. Uh, he's called a rubber boa because if you were to feel him, and you can touch him, he looks and he feels like rubber. They can get up to about 30 inches in length. And there's a couple reasons you don't see them very often. Uh, one is they live at the higher elevations Mm. along the tree line, the forest, but they also live on the forest floor in the leaves and in the vegetation. And they're nocturnal, which means they come out at night. So if you have something that's colored like this that as an adult really doesn't get much longer than that mm -hmm. and comes out at night, you're not going to see him too often. Right. But uh, anyway, he's also harmless and he's just fun. You want to talk about him, the two heads? And I'm um, sure, yeah, so the pioneers sometimes we call these uh, two-headed snakes because when they are threatened, they'll coil up into a ball and they'll stick their, their tail out with, the, you know, like maybe a bird's going to attack them or something. The hopes is that the bird will grab the tail and the rest of the body can crawl off and, uh, and be fine. Um, in some of, the, some of the individual species, you'll even see little dots on their tail that look like eyes. This guy doesn't really have those. Uh, but 
Anyway, so they're called two-headed snakes, and like Frank said, they're, they are nocturnal for the most part, and uh, they do live up in the tree line, and they eat very small rodents. Hmm. Um, and they're just kind of cool little snakes. They're really uh, harmless. Yeah, I mean, when you first brought it out, I said it reminds me, it looks like a worm, yeah, right? It, so is that common for people to... Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, confuse snakes and worms, mm -hmm. uh, just in general. Um, in fact, uh, when, when you look at these animals, you gotta understand that they are vertebrate animals. You know, they do have a backbone, they have a spinal cord, uh, they have all the same organs that we have. They have lungs, they have, a kid they have kidneys, they have liver, they have digestive organs. Um, they're actually way more similar to what we are than what they would be to a worm. So, hmm. so where are these animals kept here in Idaho? Uh, like in captivity? Yes. So um, there's a number of people who keep snakes as pets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as Frank and I, uh, we keep these animals and almost every one of them is a rescue. So a lot of people will get these animals and then all of a sudden they don't want them. Um, they'll get a, you know, a cute little red tail boa constrictor that's this big at the pet store and then five years later it's eight feet long and, and they can't house it anymore. So uh, these animals, um, we keep them in our homes and you have to have special enclosures for them. Uh, these are ectothermic animals uh, or cold blooded, right? So they don't generate heat within their body. So you have to provide an enclosure with the proper heat source and the proper diet and everything. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a number of people around the valley that, that do keep these animals as pets. And, and I think that's okay as long as you're educating yourself on what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Is this one of the snakes that you also have in your workshop? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which one out of these two do you find people you know, like the most or are most interested to? Uh, I think they're interested in all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, That's why they take the workshop. It's not a matter. And people ask us every so often, well, if you had to choose one. And you know, you can't do it because part of the fascination and also what these guys can teach us, and we actually call in the workshop, we call these guys the teaching assistants. Uh, the students really take the workshop for these guys mm -hmm. and not for us. We just help out. Uh, but uh, uh, there's, everyone has something different, different to offer. And when we learn where they live and how they live and how they've adapted to their environment, then that helps us understand the difference in species and also helps us understand a whole ecosystem, how every living thing within a like even in the area around Boise, is dependent upon each other for its mm -hmm. survival. Awesome. Well, is the, there was another one that you brought that you well, want us to... Yeah, these are the two we brought that are Idaho natives, because mm -hmm. in the workshop we do talk about Idaho natives, but we also talk about... We actually talk about all kinds of amphibians and reptiles in the workshop. Yeah, we cover, uh, you know, frogs, salamanders, uh, crocodilians, turtles, tortoises, um, lizards, so you, you name it, it pretty much if, if it's an amphibian or a reptile we'll definitely cover mm -hmm. it. We do have a, a, a little bit of a larger emphasis on snakes and, and I think one of the reasons why is these animals are kind of, um, they're, they're kind of maligned in popular media and, and, and people are afraid of them. So uh, I think it's good to bring these animals out and show people that they're totally different than what most people expect mm -hmm. them to be. They're not aggressive and, and, uh, and they're actually really cool creatures. And he's really shy. He doesn't want to come out, he says. <laughs> come here, buddy. Uh, since we just looked at Idaho's native boa constrictor, we thought it would be fun to bring a boa constrictor who is not an Idaho native, but rather is a native of the island of Madagascar off of Africa. And this is called the Dumeril's ground boa of Madagascar. And it only lives on the island of Madagascar. And this guy is, he's about adult size. The females get a little bigger. But uh, he's also under international law, under CITES, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. He's considered an endangered species. So he helps in the workshop to help people understand about conservation, mm -hmm. about endangered animals, and also about snakes and how they behave. And can you guess what, how, what part of the forest he lives in by looking at his pattern? Um, 
the desert. No. No, no he's <laughs> of in the Of course I'm wrong. He's in a forest. He's yeah. in remember tropical environment. So so now imagine him buried in like the leaf litter at the base of a tree, right? And 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 then think about his pattern here. He'd almost be completely invisible. Mm. And so this is an ambush predator. Uh, these guys will go into an area and they use that tongue of theirs, that, which, is, um, th which is their greatest sense. And you'll notice it's a forked tongue. And so what they're doing is they're picking up molecules in the air. And then they can interpret where certain molecules are in higher concentration based on which fork of the tongue is getting a greater amount of the molecule. Mm -hmm. So they will find uh, an area where prey items are heavy, so they'll kind of use their tongue to find those locations, and then they'll just hide out un it within the leaves and the, and the grasses on the, on the forest floor and wait for a rodent to run by and then you know, reach out and grab them. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But you can tell a lot about this animal just based really on, on looking at them. He's large, he's bulky, they tend to be more of your ambush predators. And he has this very cryptic pattern, uh, which would be great for camouflage. So mm. you can kind of tell how he behaves in the wild just by looking at uh, his coloration and his body shape. Now, something else to, to learn about him, you notice he's trying to get off the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you notice when he goes off the table, he goes right under and he's trying to hide. And so what he's telling us is the thing people do not realize about snakes. And, and I call it a, the, a silent secret of snakes, that they're nothing like what people think they are, and they really are very, very shy. And all he wants to do right now is just simply find some place that's small and dark and warm that he can hide. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he's trying to do. And when he goes under here, he feels like he's safe. And you notice when, when Scott had the rubber boa, which is a cousin of him, believe mm -hmm. it or not, and actually the big boas that get to be 12, 20 feet, 15 feet long, and even are also the relatives. And anacondas, which are uh, a form, they're of, a form of boa They're a form of boa, one of the largest snakes in the world. But they're all related. But anyway, when you saw the little rubber boa, it was trying to crawl up Scott's arm and trying to find a place to hide also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like his skin. Yeah, they're really a, a beautiful snake, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty sad that uh, they're so heavily endangered in the wild. And they're endangered primarily, well, everything in Madagascar really is endangered because of destruction of habitat, which is the biggest threat to wildlife mm -hmm. worldwide. So I mentioned your website, ecosnake.com, mm -hmm. and that's kind of part of your mission is to educate on you know, wild and captive care of these animals. So is there anything else that you wanted to add about your website? Just, you know, what's your goals for this? No, but if people visit the website, I think the main service it can provide is there's a section on there that says frequently asked questions. And it's basic questions like, what do I do if I see a snake in my yard? Which actually is the quick answer to that is nothing. If you leave it alone, it'll go away. <laughs> but in that type of question and behavior of snakes, and there's also a section on, on fish and game rules pertaining to our native amphibians and reptiles. And that's the biggest resource for the average person if they, if they want some information about these guys. Yeah, I can see he's hiding down here. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I'm like almost mesmerized by him right now. <laughs> this is awesome. Well, that's why people used to think snakes hypnotized. That was one of mm -hmm. the myths. There's a lot of myths about snakes. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them was that, that. And the reason is snakes don't have movable eyelids. You know, he can't blink. So it looks like he's staring at you all the time. And he really mm -hmm. isn't. It's just the, <laughs> It's just that uh, he's looking for a place and sensing his main sense organ is his tongue, like Scott talked about, and he's just simply trying to find a place to go hide. Mm -hmm. he's, it's nothing personal, but I don't like you people. I want to <laughs> go away. So what would be some other myths maybe about these other snakes that we saw? I think the greatest myth about these animals is how aggressive they are. Mm -hmm. You know, if you watch any television show that has uh, snakes involved, you've got these animals like, you know, snakes on a plane or... Yeah. The, the movie that was so bad it was almost good, Anaconda. Um, they, there's this assumption out there that these animals are very aggressive and they're going to come after you and they're going to kill you and eat your children and everything else. And what you'll find is, uh, and what we've been finding just sitting here, is that the snakes really just kind of want to yep, get out of sight. We looked at three snakes and they all just simply want to get away. Right. Mm -hmm. And ha having been a wildlife veterinary te technician, I can tell you 
that if we were doing a program on any other animal, I mean, even if we were doing it on, you know, the fox squirrel or something like that, we'd probably all come away from this, you know, dripping blood from our hands and everything because the thing would just chew us to pieces, you know. I mean, animals, wild animals, don't want humans touching them. Mm -hmm. and, and really, these are wild animals. Uh, you can't domesticate a snake. Um, and yet they just kind of sit here and tolerate us. And he's mm -hmm. also right now, two things are happening. He's enjoying the warmth from the lights, mm -hmm. but you also notice as if, if we were to stay here longer than we're going to today, he would get much more active as he warms up. Mm -hmm. Because remember, like Scott said, they're ectothermic, sometimes called cold-blooded, which means he has to get his warmth to live from what's going on up here. Awesome. This is just so cool. Um, so you, I read on your art, on your website, excuse me, that you wrote an essay about the silent secret of mm -hmm. snakes. And what motivated you to write that, you know, for your website? And I noticed that it was at the beginning of when you started teaching this website, or excuse me, the... Um, Workshop. Yes, thank yeah. you, I, uh, here at Boise State. I actually w wrote the silent secret of snakes. snakes. Now you have me doing it. <laughs> snakes essay, uh, uh, several years before. I wrote it in 1990 and part of it was as I became more interested in these animals and one of the reasons the group of us in town started the Herpetological Society was to have a place for folks who are interested in these animals to go to share information and to learn about them. But also you tell your friends that gee I'm interested in snakes and they all look at you like oh you're weird. <laughs> and so so many people uh, started to, I'd get, they don't really say it, but you get the, they have the expression, weird. And so I decided, well, I need to write down something that tells why I like them. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's a personal thing. Other people have different reasons. But I became interested in, like I said at the very beginning, because it was something different from me. And it was something that I had heard for most of my life that, you know, I should be afraid of it or I should should certainly run away from it or something. And then as I started to study them, I realized, well, yeah, I you know, don't have to do that if I understand them. So I think part of the message in my essay was that they can't talk. They have a whole different sensory system than we do. So we have to learn how they behave by observing them and putting ourselves in their situation which I think is not a bad message for all of us just as humans, even in dealing with each other. How do we appreciate something that's different from us and, and has different behavior and yet we can all coexist together? So it was mainly to try to, I wrote it to tell people, hey, you know, just because it's different from us doesn't mean that, that there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with it. It's because it's part of the ecosystem, it's part of nature. And that's what we hope in the workshop, that students come away learning when they see all of these animals. That uh, there's a role and they're very vital and we can all benefit from each other. Mm -hmm. Well, we just have a few minutes left. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add about these snakes or maybe some you know, facts for people when they're seeing them in the wild? Yeah, we, and in fact, we did bring one other snake, so oh, maybe okay. while uh, Frank's getting that out, I could uh, uh, talk about him. One of the big things that we try to teach in the workshop is how to be safe around these animals. And in Idaho, uh, we really only have one dangerous snake to humans, and that's the Great Basin Rattlesnake. And so what I would recommend people do is really take the time to educate yourself on where you're going to find those animals, what time of day, because remember they are ectothermic so their activity changes with how much heat's outside, and um, how you can behave around them to be safe. Um, and again, if you go to the EcoSnake website, we have a number of, uh, or, or quite a bit of information on, on how to stay s safe around uh, rattlesnakes. We brought this corn snake, or it's a, it actually a red rat snake, but it's more commonly called a corn snake, uh, because a lot of people ask, well, if I were going to keep a snake, uh, what would be the best to keep? And we actually feel this one is the best. All of the ones that you see like this are all bred in captivity. They're not taken out of the wild. Uh, 
they come in all kinds of different colors. They actually in the wild are native to the southeastern United States. But we brought this guy just simply to show you one that, and just to that show is you, docile and, and uh, colorful. That's why they call them corn snakes. <laughs> they look like an ear yeah, of corn. Yeah, they can have that uh, you know, Native American mm -hmm. ear of corn type appearance. So. And I noticed that you brought this one far away. You don't want them interacting. No, at all. no, they wouldn't. They probably wouldn't bother each other at all. Uh, now, you do have to be careful with some species because there are s some snakes out there, like king snakes, that will eat other snakes. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to get them near each other. But these guys, you know, it just kind of clearing up room so, mm -hmm. so he can have the spotlight right now. Because <laughs> he also is feeling the warmth. Mm -hmm. so, but he's also looking for a place to hide. And if we just let him go for a second here, I think you'll see him do what the others have been doing. Did, I'm sorry, did you say that this one was common in Idaho or? No, this no. is not a native, this is native to the southeastern oh, right. United States. But these are probably one of the most common snakes in the pet trade. And in fact, if you were to get one of the, uh, get a snake as a pet, these would be one yeah, of the that's best. That's why we brought him, mm. yeah. to show. Just because they they stay small. I mean, this is about as big as they get. And they're very docile um, and just really cool, cool snakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't really want me petting him. Yeah, typically if you, you pet down the body a little bit more, mm -hmm. they're okay with it. But and the reason, the only reason they even respond at all is because we're warm and they like the, they like the warmth. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you for bringing all these animals today for us to look at. They're all, this one's actually probably my favorite just because I like his skin the most. Yeah, he's really pretty. Well, great. Again, thank you for coming and joining me today. Once again, I'd just like to thank my guests, Frank Lundberg and Scott Smith, for joining me. I'm Jamie Bingham, and from everyone here at University Television, thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.